Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on the role of Indigenous communities in reducing and responding to climate change through sustainable land use practices, which is co-hosted by the Columbia Centre on Sustainable Investment, the Land Portal and Landessa. I'm very glad to be moderating this discussion. I am Sam Zoki Burke, a legal researcher at the Columbia Centre on Sustainable Investment, where I focus on the impacts of land-based investments on local and Indigenous communities. On September 27, later this month, we will co-host an event in New York on the climate crisis, global land use and human rights. And so I'm especially keen to learn from our discussants on today's webinar. And indeed, this webinar is timely. Indigenous lands across the world are under attack and in some cases they are literally on fire. The Amazon fires in particular are inextricably linked to the climate crisis, which is both an existential emergency and the result of many political failures. While a changing climate already increased the risks of forest fires, when this was combined with deliberately weakened environmental protections, policies aimed at opening up the Amazon to in industry by extending infrastructure and dangerous rhetoric calling for the development of indigenous land, farmers and ranchers were emboldened to announce a day of fire. The results were wildfires of epic proportions, prompting international concern and indig indigenous outcry regarding the fate of the Amazon. Relevantly for our conversation today, Indigenous leaders, including Sonia Guajajara of the Articulation of Indigenous People of Brazil, noticed, no, noted that demarcation of Indigenous lands is a critical first step for their protection from deforestation and destruction. Indeed, despite their cultural and geographical diversity, Indigenous peoples around the world seem to often share the characteristic of being the world's oldest and best protectors against environmental destruction. Another important recent development for today's discussion is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's recent report on climate change and land use. The report, whose summary spans over 1,000 pages, concludes that the current rates of land conversion and tropical forest destruction are accelerating the climate crisis, producing water scarcity, degraded lands and decreased food security. The report also notes in its inimitable language style that local and indigenous knowledge and collective action is one strategy that can achieve positive climate adaptation and mitigation outcomes. And that agricultural practices that include indigenous and local knowledge contribute to overcoming the combined challenges of climate change, food security, biodiversity conservation and combating desertification and land degradation. And so now we have the chance to hear how. I'll introduce our esteemed panelists. We then have four topics to discuss before having our final half hour of the webinar reserved for an interactive Q&A discussion with you, the audience. Dr. Kanyinke Sena is the Director of the Indigenous Peoples of Africa Co-Coordinating Committee, or IPAC. IPAC is a network of 135 Indigenous Peoples organisations in 20 African countries that works to promote African Indigenous Peoples human rights and gender equality and to ensure their participation in environmental conservation and climate justice. Dr Sena is Ogiek from Kenya. He is an expert on Indigenous Peoples rights and served as chairman of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. He has a doctorate degree in law from the University of Arizona, where his thesis focused on indigenous people's rights in the context of carbon credit schemes in Kenya. Janine Yazzie is the co-founder of and CEO of Sixth World Solutions and a community activist from the United States. Through Sixth World Solutions, Janine works with Diné Navajo communities to develop projects, programs and policies that promote sustainability, environmental justice and self-governance. Six World Solutions is a community-based for-profit business that works within Navajo Nation communities to nurture local capacity building. They focus on methodologies that reinvest in community, helping to create symbiotic relationships that benefit their clients, creating resilient programs and plans. Janine also co-founded the first Navajo Nation community-led watershed planning project for local control in the sustainable management, restoration and protection of natural resources through youth engagement and community capacity building. Her conservation and human rights work has earned international recognition, including serving as the North American focal point to the UN high level political forum on the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. She now serves as the Sustainable Development Program Coordinator 
for the International Indian Treaty Council, whom she also represents as global co-convener of the Indigenous Peoples Major Group for Sustainable Development. Finally, we have Antonella Cordone, who is the Senior Technical Specialist in Nutrition at the International Fund for Agricultural Development, or IFAD. She represents IFAD at the international level and leads partnerships with the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, the Interagency Support Group on Indigenous Peoples and Indigenous Peoples Organisations. Before joining IFAD in 1999, Antonella worked as a research assistant for several programs on environmental, intercultural and Indigenous Peoples issues. Antonella holds two master's degrees, one in international cooperation and project design and another in foreign literature and languages. She lectures in several Italian universities on Indigenous peoples development, focusing on culture and identity. Let us now move on to our conversation with the panellists, beginning with a question for Janine. Janine, could you please share your thoughts on how Indigenous peoples traditional land use practices can help to combat climate change? Yes, thank you, Sam. As everyone knows, we are living in a world that is grappling with the need to develop solutions that can truly and effectively enable us to adapt to and mitigate climate change. The challenge, however, especially in venues like the UN High Level Political Forum on the 2030 Agenda and the Conference of the Parties, otherwise referred to as COP, is that the solutions are limited to those that are supported by government and corporations and which, to a large extent, maintain the status quo. This rarely provides the holistic nature-based approach that is necessary. And indigenous peoples have been dealing with these issues for generations, not only from the state of being on the front lines of climate change, but also having been on the front lines of destructive practices of our current extractive economies. We've resisted and witnessed how these industries have historically threatened sacred spaces. And many people don't understand that when we talk about sacred places, we're referring to vital ecosystems important to the well being and continuation of traditional life ways sustained through traditional land use practices. They are our mountains, our rivers, our canyons and grasslands, our deserts, our earth. It's these relationships and holistic practices that offer comprehensive solutions, such as community led integrated land and water management for food and water security. Solutions that restore, protect, and even regenerate the biodiversity that is critical for ecological health and climate change adaptation and mitigation. Indigenous peoples are able to offer these solutions because our very knowledge systems and lifeways are nature-based, and they've been built over generations of interactions with the natural world. This is our science built upon epistemologies that honor our interconnectedness to Earth, and fundamentally challenge the notions that are embedded in our economies are mainly the ideology that people, plants, animals, and planets are resources for exploitation for monetary gain. These knowledge systems facilitate a holistic approach to stewardship, challenging the premise of economic development rooted in resource exploitation to emphasize the importance of maintaining balance and regenerative relationships with the natural world. It is these knowledge systems and traditional land use practices that can inform the shift needed to evolve our collective understanding and value system to one rooted in responsibility to all life forms and to each other. This shift is necessary to inform the development of a new form of environmental governance that truly helps mitigate the impacts of climate change and the ecological disturbances that have already taken place. The key aspects of indigenous land management practices that help us accomplish this is that they teach us that effective solutions are decentralized, they are community led, they're egalitarian and not heteropatriarchal and heteronormative, meaning that there is recognized value and purpose in nurturing the leadership of women and non-conforming or non-binary relatives. And they're non-anthropogenic. They're conscious stewardship practices that understand the value of all life forms and sacred elements that are vital for our existence. This is what indigenous peoples have been bringing to the spaces where these discussions have been taking place and what empowers them to hold their ground in land conflicts. Thank you, Janine. Dr. Sano, if I can turn to you next, could you please share your thoughts on how Indigenous people's traditional land use practices can help to combat climate change? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Sam, for, uh, for, for this uh, opportunity to, to discuss this issue. Uh, I think uh, for us to, to understand this uh, topic properly, we must come from uh, understanding First, what are the land use practices that uh, 
accelerate climate change. So it's the exploitation of bio, uh, fossil fuels, uh, large scale agricultural expansion, uh, biofuel needs, uh, massive deforestation, uh, attend a massive deforestation in all parts of the world. And when we look at indigenous people's cultures throughout the world, uh, it's probably impossible to find a community, an indigenous community that does some of these things that cause climate change. We don't see communities doing large scale commercial agriculture, large scale beef farming. We don't see that. So among indigenous communities, uh, land is communally owned and it's governed and managed as a group as opposed to the current system where it's uh, managed individually to satisfy individual greed. Uh, in this communally owned land and communally managed land, the grazing and hunting patterns are controlled on the basis of uh, customary law. Uh, this leads to uh, health, uh, to healthy the environment, and of course, conservation is a result of uh, uh, th those healthy environments. So, through this conservation method, we see in uh, pastoralist communities, we see controlled grazing pattern, management by fire. Even the migratory patterns, when people follow the weather conditions, wherever they go, whether they are pastoralists or hunter gatherers, they follow it in a pattern. They are not just going haphazardly. And following this pattern enables the parts of the territory that they live to heal, to heal. So even in those customary law management systems, gender roles are ascribed. There are specific roles for men and women in managing the environment. And all these practices, all this management based on customary law has a net positive impact on the environment and therefore very little uh, impact on uh, climate change. Unfortunately, most of these um, customary law system of management have been ignored in many, many parts of the world, uh, including in Africa. And there's a need to go back to those uh, the traditional land use practices by indigenous peoples. And we are glad that the IPCC is actually now recognizing the importance of land in combating uh, climate change. Thank you, Dr. Senna. Antonella, could you please tell us from your perspective at IFAD, uh, what about how you have seen indigenous peoples traditional land use practices help to combat climate change? Uh, thank you, Sam, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, webinar. Um, now, climate change adaptation and building the resilience of vulnerable smallholder people are the central aspects of IFAD's work, underpinning the fund's strategic vision of inclusive and sustainable rural transformation. In fact, strategic objective three focuses on environmental sustainability and climate resilience of poor rural people's economic activities. IFAD has earmarked 25% of its total portfolio of loans and grants to climate-related initiatives. Climate change issues have been mainstreamed in IFAD's entire program of loans and grants by way of climate risk screening and the instrument we have is the Social, Environmental and Climate Assessment Procedures, the SECAP, which act as safeguards throughout the project cycle, assess the potential risks of proposed interventions. Through, best, through better risk identification, the procedures aim to move from a do no harm mentality and approach to a proactive in doing good wherever IFAD's operations are. The SECAP includes a mandatory principle, which is the principle of free prior and informed consent whenever IFAD works in indigenous people's territories. And this is enshrined in IFAD policy on engagement with indigenous peoples. IFAD manages the Adaptation for Smallholder Agricultural Program, the ASAP, which encompasses 41 countries and 42 projects um, for a value of about $316 million. 
The program is the world's premier vehicle for adaptation aimed specifically at smallholder communities. A prime example of IFAD's collaboration with local communities can be found in Vietnam, the Mekong Delta in Vietnam's main crop production area. However, this area is highly vulnerable to impacts of climate change. An IFAD government of Vietnam investment project that emphasizes climate smart value chains is supporting at risk community in Ben Tre and Travin provinces. The project now uh, is in its fourth year. Uh, it aims to reach 30,000 households across the two provinces and it piloted a participatory climate-informed commune and district socioeconomic development plan to develop community-based action plans for natural resource and um, management and natural disaster management and climate change adaptation. To implement the plan, the project established a climate change adaptation fund. And this fund provides matching grants to farmers common interest groups for developing value chains of commodities and scaling up agricultural practices that are resilient to climate change. These grants focus on environmentally friendly and safe agricultural production models, such as fodder plantation for cattle raising, water saving irrigation facility, oyster raising adapted to changing environments, biofertilizers for maize and peanut production, and organic methods in coconut farming. 48 models are being rolled out at the household level, showing promising financial and social return in increased income and dietary diversification. In recognition on women's advances in the economy of communities, the project has helped set up a women's development fund. And this fund provides microfinance services to about 30,000 women, which participate in about 60,000 saving and credit groups. It is assisted by project in building its capacity for registration as a microfinance institution. And this is one of the examples we can provide um, related to the use of um, financial research, resources at IFAD for adaptation. Thank you, Antonella. And we'll talk more about adaptation later on in this webinar as well. Um, having heard about Indigenous land use practices, may I now ask you, Dr. Senna, if you could speak about what threats to these Indigenous land use practices currently exist and what strategies can Indigenous peoples and their allies pursue to, to protect these practices? Dr. Senna, I think your microphone is currently on mute if you were able to unmute it. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thanks. Oh, okay. So I'm saying that uh, to understand the threats, uh, one must actually be informed thoroughly of uh, the continued impact of the doctrine of discovery on Indigenous peoples' rights all over the world. And the permanent forum on, uh, did a study on the doctrine of discovery several years ago, I think in 2011 and 2012, and I would ask all interested people to go back to that report and uh, look at this uh, doctrine of uh, discovery and the continued impact. Because essentially, uh, the doctrine of discovery still informs the laws and policies uh, in most uh, countries in the world. And these laws and policies actually favor privatization, individualization of land over that communal ownership that I discussed uh, before. And among indigenous communities, when you individualize the land, the first thing, the first net effect of that is to, is to actually reduce the, cult the, the, the cultural practice. Uh, and then that leads automatically to the breakdown of indigenous people's uh, 
uh, cultures and uh, communal structures. So we, we, we also notice that through these laws and policies, most indigenous people's uh, land rights are not recognized throughout the world because uh, indigenous people suffer marginalization all over the world. If you are not connected to the center of power, then automatically your land rights will not be recognized because you are not on the table, you are not heard, you are not visible. So in that case, then decisions are made on indigenous people's territories without the actual participation, involvement, or interest of indigenous peoples uh, being taken care of. And unfortunately, in the rare situations where indigenous people's rights are recognized, for example, in Africa, poverty is increasingly cont contributing to indigenous people selling those lands uh, through these uh, willing buyer, willing seller frameworks. One lands is individualized, and so governments say we have recognized indigenous people's land rights, we have given them individual title deeds, but automatically because of poverty, these communities end up selling that land on a willing bear, uh, willing, willing buyer, willing seller basis. Uh, the changing livelihood systems of indigenous communities is also an issue that we must uh, really discuss in the context of land rights and climate change, because when, wherever we go, Pastoralists are increasingly being forced to be settled communities. Hunting and gathering is criminalized in most of Africa. And this is really leading to the change, the change lifestyle systems is actually contributing to indigenous people uh, doing things that they never used to do, to do before, for example, clearing the environment to farm. The other key aspect, the other key threat here is the aspect of corruption in the land sector. In Africa, corruption is a very, very huge issue, especially in the land sector. When you go to the ministry, the commission that are formed, even in court decisions are not implemented. There's massive corruption in the land sector in Africa. So, but we also see that as the world discusses solutions to climate change, for example, what can what are governments doing to adapt to climate change? Uh, they resort to things like biofuels, which result automatically in clearing large scale territories and mostly in indigenous people's territories. Large energy projects like dams also targeting indigenous people's territories as a climate change response. So indigenous peoples find themselves in a situation where uh, climate change is a problem, but at the same time, the solutions to climate change is another problem. And then if indigenous people themselves are very, very were greatly resource constrained to try to adapt, mitigate, or even to try to be on the table to participate, to discuss some of the solutions that uh, uh, they, they may have. So some of the strategies that I could uh, propose is um, uh, uh, law and policy reforms to kind of uh, recognize more communal land rights and governance systems. We are happy that in several countries in Africa, like for example, Kenya, where I come from, this is a discussion that is currently on the table. We have a community land rights act. We are trying to operationalize it. We see the importance of traditional knowledge, which actually informs indigenous people's management practices being put on the table through the local communities and indigenous people's platform at the UNFCCC. Uh, we also see a focus, uh, an increasing focus on indigenous women land rights and this in a way helps in, uh, in uh, bringing back the indigenous governance systems because because of climate change many men are moving away from the villages and the women who remain there so their their traditional knowledge their governance systems and practices would help but most importantly also because of the livelihood challenges then incentivizing conservation becomes a very very important strategy so we have seen uh, in africa for example the francophone region we have seen uh, the red flag process really um, bringing indigenous peoples on the table and through this discussion, indigenous peoples themselves are now becoming active uh, participants in con the conservation of the, of the, of the Mao forest. Uh, however, I think without really addressing corruption means a change and then uh, uh, also trying to find community-driven solutions. For example, uh, when we look at the energy sector, for example, countries want to provide electricity to everybody. That is part of the 
UN Sustainable Development Goals. But the approach is large scale projects when they can alternatively go for small scale community individual farm projects like biogas to achieve the same objective other than constructing a big dam or a big, uh, or a big uh, geothermal uh, plant. So uh, some of these solutions, uh, some of these strategies could really help uh, secure indigenous people's land rights for the basis of, for the purposes of uh, addressing, adapting, mitigating to climate change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Senna. And I am aware that um, uh, one of our other panelists, Janine, is a, has been closely involved with the Right Energy Partnership, which, is, which I think is the sort of example you're talking about of a community indigenous driven approach to the energy crisis. So perhaps um, our audience might like to ask questions about that specific example in the Q&A session later on. Uh, in the meantime, let me pose the same question to Antonella. Um, what threats to Indigenous land use practices do you perceive and what strategies can Indigenous peoples and their allies pursue to protect them? Uh, uh, thank you, Sam, and, and thank you to Kaninke who really pointed out to the uh, fundamental issues when it comes to threat. I, I, I wish to go back a bit to the adaptation to climate change um, and, and building resilience, which is really context uh, specific. Uh, vulnerability is not uniform um, and it is determined by many factors and including the level of climate risk and socioeconomic status. And this is something that a policy making level needs to be understood. Um, location and characteristics of the natural resource base also act as determinants of uh, vulnerability. Uh, so uh, adaptation measures are not universally applicable and they need to be assessed on the specificities of the contexts. Now, with about 400 million indigenous peoples in the world, who are spread across about 90 countries, uh, they own, occupy or use up to 22% of the global uh, land area, um, which still today is home to 80% of the world's biological diversity. Indigenous people's knowledge uh, frequently accrued over generations and centuries guides their interactions with their surrounding environment. Uh, this is locally fine-tuned knowledge, which is of the utmost importance in the struggle to adapt to climate change. In short, uh, by providing local level expertise, indigenous people's traditional knowledge offers vital insights to complement conversational science, environmental observations, and model predictions. And more than that, this knowledge of indigenous peoples has provided a holistic understanding of the environment, natural resources, and the human interactions with them. Through this extensive catalog of knowledge and experience, many indigenous peoples' communities have developed strategies to cope with unusual weather events and worsening climate conditions. This knowledge is used um, to diversify livelihood systems to cope with alterations to the environment conditions, including climate change. And this knowledge is reflected in diversity of peoples, which corresponds to the diversity of knowledge and the diversity of crops and farming systems, as well as their hunting, herding, gathering, and fishing systems. Now, if the land territories and resources of indigenous peoples are not protected, if their collective rights are not protected, and evidence shows that natural resource management and carbon low uh, development initiatives are where indigenous peoples live, uh, we will not be able to sustain what indigenous peoples have sustained for millennia. So to me, this is the huge threat uh, to indigenous peoples, uh, because central to any development is their secure tenure over, life, over rights um, and the transfer of knowledge from generation to generation. And the other threat there is that this knowledge 
if not maintained, cannot be transferred to future generations. So uh, what is key to me, it's uh, a central is the land and is the knowledge that need to be transferred to the future generations. Thank you, Antonella. Janine, we would like to hear from you on this question. How do you perceive the threats to Indigenous customary land use practices, including those that can help address climate change? And what, strat what strategies can Indigenous peoples and their allies pursue to protect them? I, I just want to start off by agreeing wholeheartedly with my colleagues and what they're sharing, um, because it's so important to know the reality and the potential of these alternative approaches to building solutions and, and these characteristics that they have. Um, and I'm, I'm going to feel like a broken record on this webinar because I'm going to keep coming back to this. Like our, our, our challenge, like our vulnerabilities and our adaptation techniques may be varied and different across the different geographies that we're living in. but the, the challenges are the same and, and generations of colonization has had a huge impact on the ability of indigenous peoples to carry out these very practices that we're talking about. Whether we are in so-called developed nations or developing nations, those challenges remain the same. Colonization, both historic and ongoing, has always been tied to the capitalistic exploitation of indigenous peoples, lands, territories, and resources, and that's why they're always under threat. Since the foundations of our modern economies were structured to literally facilitate the accumulation of wealth of white landholding males, our modern social inequalities are also woven into the fabric of these extractive economies. This history is so important to understand because colonization has led to the theft and privatization of lands, territories, and resources that were held communally and managed sustainably. And to go back to that type of management, we have to confront these issues and these truths. Over time, the management of these lands became controlled and embedded in the institutions of government created by the people who benefited most from this theft. As we can see in the Amazon and around the world, as you shared, Sam, in the introduction, these practices are still ongoing. They're happening all over. In the United States, the majority of my work is helping indigenous tribes, organizations, and advocates navigate complicated bureaucracies and jurisdictional issues just to be able to revive our continued traditional land use practices. As a result, both domestically and internationally, a large part of my work ends up being centered on protecting the rights of indigenous peoples, land rights defenders, and human rights defenders. Here in the US, threats to towards uh, land rights and human rights defenders is happening through the creation of new laws which criminalize these people for the standing in opposition to these destructive practices. The term eco-terrorism is being used as well as the application of riot laws, laws that were created through lobbyists connected with fossil fuel companies. We know what's been happening in so-called developing countries, but here in the US, we're also simultaneously seeing the same things, along with the reduction of hard-won environmental laws and protections to further expedite the approval of these types of projects. These are very much enabled by the rise in fascism, nationalism, and heteropatriarchy in government, which is only further strengthened by the military and prison industrial complex because that's how these institutions work and how they have historically worked to restrict the rights and practices of indigenous peoples and local communities when those rights and practices are not in line with corporate and government interests. These events have enabled the increase of violence against land rights and human rights defenders at a time when their work is most critical. And because of this, it's paramount for allies to know and for anyone who is concerned about and invested in solutions to climate change to know that indigenous rights are human rights and they're, they're necessary for the continuation of traditional knowledge systems and land use practices that offer non-anthropogenic solutions for long-term sustainability and preservation. But they're also necessary for the protection and regeneration of biological diversity. Our solutions come from our original instructions, our, our some call them natural laws. Our elders and ancestors have known longer than Neil de Tyson that we are made of stars. Long before the phenomenon of quantum physics and what we know as systems thinking, we knew that we're intrinsically connected even at a molecular level and that water is life and is a fundamental element to for all life. The biggest impact of colonization is that its aim and function was to displace and remove people through destruction of these knowledge systems and practices from our connection to the natural world. 
And as a result, we've built societies and institutions that have reinforced these ideologies, and we've lost a very deep sense of our own humanity. Just this morning, I woke up to yet another story of a man um, not much older than me, a husband, a father of five, and a forest protector of the Karen forest dwellers in Thailand who was brutally tortured and murdered after being arrested by Thailand forest officials and disappeared five years ago. His name was Billy and his crime was taking on a mission to fix oppressive forest laws, to recognize indigenous peoples and local communities as the forest guardians, to respect their customs and rights. And his body was found stuffed in an oil barrel that was set on fire. And his wife rightly asked, how on earth could they possibly do that to Billy? Are these people still human? John Trudell, you know, is one of our most notable advocates and poets. And during his life of advocacy, he also faced an enormous loss. His whole family was killed in a mysterious fire at a time when he was under heavy surveillance by the FBI. And he, is, he has said, um, you know, emphasizing what, what we're doing as indigenous peoples that I'm just a human being trying to make it in a world that is rapidly losing its understanding of being human. If you don't know his name, YouTube him, Google him. There's no reason not to know him. The FBI considered him a grave threat, not only because he was a part of the American Indian movement, but because of the power of his words, because he was a gifted orator. This is the threat we pose when we're fighting for our rights. There is no reason not to follow or be aware of these, these, these continued practices. People have, in our hyper-connective world of social media, people have every ability to file, follow indigenous people's rights advocates and land rights defenders, to read and support the journalism that highlights their voices, to get in touch with organizations like International Indian Treaty Council, Cultural Survival, um, read publications like Intercontinental Cry, so many. There's so many out there. There's no excuse in, in this day and age to remain ignorant of these issues. And indeed, our lives and our humanity depends on it. If people do not protect our human rights and land rights defenders, our forest protectors, then it's going to be too late for ourselves. Thank you, Jean thank you, Janine. Um, thank you especially for providing so many concrete examples and uh, and and notes that all of us should be paying really close attention to. Um, having explored indigenous land use practices um, and the and the grave threats that that these practices encounter and face, um, we're now going to quickly move on to adaptation, uh, which is a top topic that Antonella has already discussed. So Antonella, if we can continue the conversation with you, are you able to add anything further on how Indigenous communities uh, are already adapting to climate change and if there are any strategies uh, or other practices that we can learn from and seek to replicate? Um, uh, thank you, uh, Janine, for, for your uh, passionate and touching intervention. And um, now, yeah, going back to our experience to to adaptation, um, uh, we know uh, that you know indigenous peoples um, are custodians of a vast quantity of of natural resources, um, including the, the 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 world's biodiversity, and um, and people, but they are also at the front line of climate change and frequently uh, live in very hostile environment. Uh, now, to give a short answer uh, to your question, uh, Sam, uh, the best strategy for indigenous peoples to adapt to climate change uh, is to ensure that their rights to land territories and resources uh, are protected. Because when this happens, uh, then, uh, the land, the environment, the social, the economic um, is uh, sustained. And this contributes significantly um, to low carbon emissions and particularly to biodiversity and genetic diversity, which is one of the key threats of humanity. Uh, there are several examples at IFAD in working uh, with indigenous peoples for them uh, to lead and build uh, adaptive capacities in their land and territories. Um, indigenous peoples constitute a key target of um, IFAD 
um, target group we work in our interventions, particularly in Asia and Latin America. Uh, and we also work with pastoralists in, in Africa, uh, where I, I must say it's not that easy. Um, and uh, IFAD has established a number of instruments to dialogue directly with indigenous peoples and to finance directly their own initiatives. Uh, I'm referring to the Indigenous Peoples Forum at IFAD um, and the dedicated fund, which is the Indigenous Peoples Assistance Facility, which so far has uh, financed uh, about 162 projects uh, for about $5 million. Uh, dollars. Um, why the facility is important? The EPAF is important because it's a totally demand-driven um, uh, fund where indigenous people send their proposals, their solutions so, uh, uh, from the issues and they implement themselves their projects on the ground. And the facility is governed directly by indigenous peoples uh, representatives who um, go through the proposals and who select the proposals. Now, one of the problems we have with this facility is that the demand is so high compared to the projects we can uh, uh, finance. Um, but uh, it's amazing to see the number of innovations that these proposals include. Um, when they are submitted to us in terms of climate adaptation, but not only that, uh, generally they have a holistic uh, approach. Um, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the loans that uh, IFAD implements with the governments, I mean, the government impl implements projects that are financed by IFAD, I would like to um, provide you with a very interesting example in Bolivia. Uh, this is the Accessos project, um, uh, where we worked uh, putting resources from the Adaptation Fund, about $10 million. And this project is interested, interesting because it's a two-pronged approach to adaptation. Um, and namely the development of community adaptation capacity and climate risk management. Um, the project is characterized by the strong participatory approach, uh, which involves documenting local practices used to cope with climate change, generating talking maps, uh, which are georeferenced and include an inventory of communities' natural resources and model projections, and the transfer of resources in the form of competition prices, which are the concursos. By the end of 2018, um, over 1,700 hectares of land had been brought under climate resilient practices, 55 talking maps that incorporated risk management had been generated and 253 community leaders had been sensitized to the risks associated with climate change. Uh, participation in relation to the concursos has also been strong with about 300 communities participating in the management competitions. And furthermore, the participatory nature of the process is illustrated by the fact that 2,500 communities now have elaborated climate hazard self-diagnosis. And perhaps the real success of the project lies in the fact that indigenous peoples have engaged in designing the project since the very beginning and are leading the implementation at community level. The project is recovering traditional practices, knowledge and technologies associated with agricultural cycle and integrating them into project activities. These initiatives include, for instance, the Pachagrama information system, which collates and registers indigenous people's knowledge on bioindicators, the behavior of plants and, and animals. Uh, this is one of what project that, uh, I mean, we, we are really proud of because um, it has been designed with indigenous peoples and they're leading the implementation on the ground and that is why we can provide uh, 
um, success stories on how to blend traditional knowledge with modern technologies. Thank you, Antonella. Uh, and I agree. I think, uh, you know, if we're looking for concrete strategies for allies of Indigenous peoples, then funders who really try to meaningfully engage with the concept of Indigenous ownership and free, prior and informed consent um, can learn a lot from the approach of the Indigenous Peoples Assistance Facility, which really does put communities um, in the driving seat in terms of how um, funds will be spent. Um, Janine, do you have any thoughts about on effective Indigenous adaptation strategies or approaches and how they might hold additional insights or potential for replication or expansion? Yes, uh, there are so many lessons and practices being revived by Indigenous peoples on how to build sustainable and localized food systems, for example, even in drought stressed regions, uh, leading to the development of the concept of food sovereignty, which goes beyond food security in that it's not just about access or increasing the numbers of grocery stores in a given community, uh, but instead it looks at the entire chain of production, distribution and consumption to nurture sustainable localized traditional food foods productions, which is much more re resilient to the effects of climate change and can help us better adapt to the long-term changes. There, are, Simultaneously, there are growing examples on how to nurture a just transition to sustainable economies across Canada and the US and in other places around the globe, and how to restructure our economies using new technologies such as cryptocurrencies to restore traditional trade systems, such as being done by the nation of Hawaii, bringing in traditional land use practices and knowledge systems into a viable, highly technological economy. Um, along with this, there are efforts um, to nurture how to build restorative and regenerative economies that increase our ability to mitigate the impacts of climate change and to facilitate adaptation to the long-term changes. There's just so many ways that Indigenous peoples have been using their knowledge systems and traditional land use practices to provide these pathways forward. And it's important to understand that when we're talking about traditional knowledge and traditional land use practices, we're not talking about something that is stagnant or relevant, relegated to like some distant past, but living knowledge systems, living and evolving knowledge systems that bring a different perspective to ha on how to build uh, and share information and, and data and, and science that can inform us how to be better humans and how to build better societies. But the very laws and policies, even those historically developed for conservation, continue to impede these practices, either through making them illegal, cutting them off from funding, or making them ineligible for available funding mechanisms. There's a lot of like international funds that only emphasize and can only invest in the so-called global south. And I think that that shows how funding mechanisms themselves can further um, um, mis uh, obscure and, and mislead um, our, our societies about what the problems are and how, to, how we all need to build solutions. Um, but obviously the most egregious obstacles are the continued criminalization and murder of indigenous peoples. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for, for Greta and all the amazing work that she's doing to bring so much attention to our climate crisis and for taking such an unwavering stance in her commitments to address our unsustainable practices. But the reality is that indigenous peoples have been pursuing and promoting adaptation projects and solutions for such a long time. And although we have some amazing projects going that can inform many were still being killed and imprisoned at higher rates per capita than any other demographic. Our, our adaptation strategies are inextricably linked to our exercise of our rights. Where there are successes, you find that Indigenous peoples who are, are refusing to conform to the rules of the institutions of power that surround them because those institutions have created the very problems we are combating. So until we are free to live our ideologies, until we're free to live by our customary land use practices, until our sacred sites are respected and protected, it will be impossible to grow and replicate these practices. We need stronger protections for indigenous peoples and recognition and protection of their lands, territories and resources, as well as our traditional knowledge systems. This can happen much more quickly and with partnerships and agreements with allies, as well as in collective actions that hold governments and corporations accountable to these protections. We're running out of time. Indigenous peoples are facing increasing threats all around the world, even here in the US. And all we want to do is continue to build these solutions and to share them and to replicate them. 
we must do everything to protect indigenous people's rights and learn from the place-based governance systems that they have to develop equitable systems of government that can bring in different alternative pathways for a more egalitarian future. Thanks, Janine. Uh, Dr. Serna, could you give some final thoughts on this quick question of indigenous adaptation, please? Yeah, uh, thank you uh, for this uh, important question. And to concur with what my colleagues, uh, Janine and uh, uh, Antonella have said, uh, putting indigenous peoples at, um, at the forefront, especially through their land rights is quite, quite important. And also uh, uh, utilizing their traditional knowledge, their traditional knowledge management practices would play a significant role in uh, addressing climate change, especially in the continent of Africa. And the reason why I say this is uh, because when we look at the entire African continent, um, many indigenous people still live their traditional lifestyles. And when you look at every ecosystem that is still intact in Africa, it has something to do with an indigenous community living there. Unfortunately, the biggest threat we see in Africa is um, the lack of political will. The lack of political will, first of all, to recognize uh, indigenous people's land rights and to recognize their customary um, management practices based on uh, customary law. And one example I'd give you is that after the Paris uh, Agreement, each country was uh, supposed to submit a list of nationally determined contributions. And when you look at uh, the African Development uh, Bank, uh, they call it the African Hub, by the African Development Bank that brings together all nationally determined contributions of the, the 45 or so African countries, the African countries say 85% of their climate action will be determined by the support that they'll get from outside the continent. And then only 15% would be based on the local solutions that they themselves fund. But the argument we are saying is that given the wealth of traditional knowledge, because indigenous peoples in Africa are, are actually now moving around to adapt to climate change practices, African governments could achieve a lot by focusing on this traditional knowledge. And that would actually um, take higher their goals of the, of, the nationally, of the national contributions through their NDC processes. So yes, I agree, control of their lands would be key. Fortunately, uh, indigenous activists in Africa, through uh, with other partner support, are doing uh, quite uh, well through advocacy because as, as a result of that, we start seeing uh, potential changes, several changes that are happening in recognizing community lands in several parts of Africa. Uh, we see uh, indigenous peoples uh, also improving their livestock breeds, for example, for pastoralists, because they know that there's already a challenge, climate change has happened, so there's an improved breed. But we must distinguish between uh, the, the, the lifestyles of uh, indigenous people who keep livestock and the beef farming that is destroying the Amazon. Indigenous people keep livestock uh, sustainably for their protein need. They don't do that large scale farming that actually destroys the environment. So uh, we need to be supported. The other thing that we see that is playing a significant role in indigenous people adapting to climate change is modern communication technologies through mobile phones and etc. They can be able to inform themselves of what is happening in various parts of the world and then in various parts of their territories and then they move their cattle or, or their migratory habits around uh, around the information they get. But increasingly, we also see cooperation between indigenous people, weather predictors, and the meteorological departments in several African countries. So this kind of partnership is also making life uh, bearable uh, for indigenous people. They can now, uh, they, they are bringing the, the traditional knowledge science interface uh, and this is helping a lot. The other thing we are seeing is the cooperation between indigenous people and non-indigenous people. Uh, with this, in Kenya, for example, where I come from, we see indigenous people increasingly going out to non-indigenous people's communities to lease land. So one of the other examples that I'd give you uh, about uh, what is happening with indigenous people is when uh, their land has already been subdivided into individual parcels. And increasingly, in many parts of Africa, and especially in Kenya, we see 
the individual landholders coming back together to manage their land co communally. One example is the Olusuku Conservancy near the Masai Mara, 4,000 hectares owned by 45 individuals. So it was fragmented, and then this automatically resulted to increase uh, uh, degradation and poverty, and among others. But out of the process, our own, their own consultation process, this community decided to revert back this land from individual ownership to communal management. And then they developed a livelihood support system. And that's the other thing that I really want to emphasize in these indigenous uh, discussions all over the world. As much as we might want to say that indigenous peoples are very good in protecting the environment, which is perfect, they are doing great, but they also have life, livelihood needs, which must be addressed. So there, as much as we, we discuss a human rights perspective, there's also a, an important element that must be brought in that is a livelihood perspective in, in, in programming. So in this, uh, in this uh, on the civil conservancy, what they are doing is they have developed a life cycle support a livelihood support program that includes livestock farming tourism individual individual ownership caps of how much you can own within that particular land and then they have restricted land sales and of course all these are addressing to uh, are actually contributing to reduce the degradation in that area and a healthy ecosystem so if we can have some of these examples replicated across the continent and especially the land and policy the law and policy reform process that is ongoing in many parts of Africa, then I think uh, Africa would uh, would actually um, contribute significantly to reduce climate change. Unfortunately, as I've said, as I started, many African governments lack the political will to recognize land rights. And of course, they are not even thinking that traditional knowledge, the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples can contribute or can be used to contribute to adaptation or even to meet their climate change commitments as they have said in their NDCs. This is a huge, huge problem. When you look at uh, many of the laws on traditional knowledge that are coming up uh, in several African countries, including in uh, the region of bodies like uh, the African region on intellectual property, they are all, all focused on the intellectual property aspect of traditional knowledge, but not necessarily uh, how traditional knowledge can be utilized to address climate change adaptation and mitigation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Senna. And we are running a little bit behind time now. So what I'm going to do is to combine the last discussion question with two questions from uh, the audience. And for anybody else attending this webinar right now, now is definitely the time if you have any burning questions that you would like our panelists to answer. So the final question for our panelists to discuss is uh, what underlying land governance practices increase the ability of indigenous communities to face climate change? So that's one question that I would like to, that I'd like you all to respond to. And then if I can add two audience questions into the mix. The first comes from Carolyn Smith, who says that as a Native American basket weaver, I've already seen the impact of climate change on the very landscape in which we steward. Our basket weaving plants are heavily impacted by wildfire, drought and bug infestations. What would you suggest for Indigenous artists and community members to do that to help us better adapt to these new realities of climate change? And then the second audience question, uh, I don't have the person's name, but the question is for everyone, which is how do we keep young people interested in uh, and not leaving their traditional lands? So uh, with those three questions in mind, Dr. Senna, can I please turn to you and ask for a reply and if you could try to keep it to four minutes just so that we can ask additional audience questions that would be much appreciated thank you okay, okay. thank you so much uh, sam for giving me this opportunity once again i think when we talk about land governance practices we are basically referring to the procedures policies processes that relate to access rights use and development in land so in most cases in the african continent where i come from where this procedures, policies, and processes are undertaken, they are normally undertaken without consultation with indigenous peoples, without their participation, and if they are even made to participate, it's not effective participation, uh, but most importantly, without their free prior uh, and informed consent. So all, all those three things, consultation, participation, and free prior and informed consent becomes key to um, 
to, to the underlying practices that will enable indigenous people's uh, governance practices. Fortunately, and this is something that I would really ask all the listeners to be quite keen on and aware, is that uh, this is being discussed at very high level. And uh, I just want to notify you that uh, the World Conservation Congress is coming up uh, in July in France, July 2020. In in, uh, in in Paris to organize by IUCN and I, uh, IUCN is the International Union for Nature Conservation and one of the things that uh, IUCN is trying to do is to uh, lead this process of uh, uh, indigenous solutions to addressing environmental issues and that by extension means uh, climate change so there will be a two day summit I'm one of the the, the steering committee members of that process and what we are trying actually to look at is bringing indigenous people's solutions what are they indigenous people's uh, what are they actually doing to address and mitigate climate change document it and then this becomes uh, a, a, a document or a, a recommendation that will go directly to policy makers in all aspects of the environment so I may not have solutions to every question that you've asked, especially the listeners, but I'll ask you then uh, to get in touch with us so that we can explore this subject more and especially take that initiative to collect uh, the experiences from your villages, the experiences from your community, so that they can start informing this process that uh, is, is, will, will be undertaken through the World Conservation Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Senna. Um, Antonella, if I can turn to, new, to you now to answer this question about underlying land governance practices that can increase the ability of Indigenous communities yeah. to face climate change, and if you want to also offer thoughts to the audience questions that were mentioned earlier. Thank you. Sure. Um, but thank you. Now, um, to me, again, I'm, I'm sorry I feel repetitive, but uh, uh, protective the collective, collective land rights uh, and practices of indigenous peoples uh, governance systems is key. Um, uh, if really uh, they and with them us uh, can face um, uh, climate change impacts. Um, and once again, I mean some um, some examples of community-based forest management practices which. Um, uh, involve in many cases sustainability approaches um, and for instance uh, uh, conserving areas and wood cutting and, and watershed management uh, zone. Um, now uh, collectively uh, these strategies plays an important role uh, in reversing the uh, process of deforestation um, and there are many uh, practical examples, uh, for instance, in, in Borneo and Indonesia, uh, indigenous peoples utilize a shifted mosaic land pat use pattern that includes patches of natural and management forest as well as rotating fallow and permanent fields. But this can only happen if the land is used collectively. Uh, same for the Mosquito people in Nicaragua, uh, who maintain three land use types, uh, cultivated fields, pastures and forest areas. So, I mean, it's not the monocropping or um, one solution fits all for the environment. Um, uh, however, um, you know, the, the, the land governance systems and the practices of indigenous peoples, communities, and by default, all the benefits that we've been discussing in the past uh, couple of hours um, and are often under constant threat uh, for the insecurity of land tenure rights. Uh, so the um, uh, the formal tenure rights should form the foundation upon which indigenous peoples communities can build and maintain their adaptive uh, capaci capacities. Um, what is very dear uh, to me um, are, are really um, is really the position of, of the indigenous youth. Um, and uh, I had a lot of hope. 
um, in indigenous youth. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, I'm a bit concerned on what are the incentives for them uh, to continue to live in indigenous people's areas where they are under threat um, uh, not being part of or not, uh, you know, feeling completely part uh, of a society within their own country. Um, I think we have also a lot of hope seeing how um, at the global level, indigenous people, in the young people, indigenous young people are coming together to fight for, rare, for their rights. Um, and they're not only knowledgeable about their practices, um, but they're now having the double curriculum of also formal education. Um, so when it comes to protecting their knowledge, you know, they, the, the youth uh, can bring this double um, skill uh, and experience. However, I think um, uh, uh, what I say is that rights is important, but we do not survive out of rights and we cannot eat rights. So that's why for me, uh, facilities and funds uh, that can support young people um, in their activities, in what they think, in the planning of their own communities and how the governance systems within their own communities are changing. For instance, to include also uh, women and indigenous women, it's uh, something we haven't touched um, much upon today, but the importance that women play in uh, keeping um, uh, the the tradition going and being transferred to the new generation. Uh, to me, I mean, uh, like Kaninke said, uh, particularly, I don't have uh, specific answers or uh, answers that can fit everything. But to me, we should provide as much opportunity as possible, be it financial, be it of aggregation of platforms where indigenous youth can share their knowledge, can share their problems and can share uh, their solutions. Thank you, Antonella. And now to Janine uh, to have the last word on this question and then also just to re-mention re the two audience questions. Uh, one was from Carolyn Smith asking, uh, mentioning that uh, our basket weaving plants are heavily impacted by wildfire, drought, and bug infestations. What would you suggest for Indigenous artists and community members to do that help us better adapt to these new realities of climate change? And then the second question to repeat was, how do we keep young people interest, interested in and not leaving their lands? Um. Both excellent questions, all three. Um, just really quickly for the first one about land governance, I just want to echo what uh, my colleagues are saying, uh, especially Dr. Serna. We really do need political will to protect and implement in its entirety the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a starting point for many of the reasons that were already stated. And if our listeners have, are not familiar with that document, it's available online, please read it, familiarize with it, memorize it, um, because this is what will enable us to better exercise our rights and participate with free prior and informed consent in the development of solutions. Um, on the other side of this, indigenous peoples also have a responsibility to actively restore, protect our traditional knowledge systems, our language, cultures, our own forms of intellectualism, our economies, and our life ways, and build pathways for the transference of that knowledge to our younger generations. We must support the leadership of our youth, our women, our non-binary relatives, our peoples with disabilities, because we are all needed to develop the solutions that we need. No one person, our group has all the solutions and no one person, our group should be left behind as we have to co-learn and co-produce that knowledge together. Developing land governance practices uh, that are a result of collective and communal led decision-making processes. For indigenous peoples, this has always meant valuing the input of every person, even every plant and animal and element uh, to inform our decision-making processes and our decision-making goals. And to go to the question um, by our basket weaver, 
our artists are vital components of these processes. They know how to do this, especially those who continue traditional forms of creation and production, uh, as was explained. Um, so my suggestion, uh, my plea to you is to participate, our lead adaptation planning. Uh, your observations is meaningful data that can inform where there's a lack of climate monitoring specific to our homelands, what the impacts of climate change are in our communities. And this is a, a, a pervasive problem. Um, all of our indigenous communities lack access to meaningful data. And these data gaps have made it hard for um, us presenting our solutions and gaining the traction that we need to, to replicate those solutions. Um, and uh, in many of the communities that I've worked with, it's our artists and our traditional medicine people, our sheep herders, our, our traditional hunters and foragers that have knowledge and observations that are important to fill these gaps. And they're desperately needed in the development of solutions um, because we, our communities have been historically left out. Um, and, and there's no, there, our, our countries are um, wildly missing disaggregated data that shows the true impacts to indigenous communities. And so it's those people that are, are needed to, to fill in those observations and to provide that insight so that we can develop better solutions. Um, and the question of the youth, what has worked for us is really looking at what are the challenges the youth are facing in our communities. Um, and a lot of a lot of what we've seen is that youth are constantly bombarded with these with, the, with this continued messaging of assimilation that life is better out there, that life will be better for them once they leave our homelands. And that needs to stop. There's so much potential and beauty and culture and knowledge in our homelands and many and like already many of our youth are getting left behind in these in our education systems in our in our economic systems the only resources available to our youth are in the form of scholarships in many cases so that, that that's only available to you if you're actually doing well in these education systems and most of our indigenous communities are dealing with about 25 to 60 percent high school dropout rates and so when the, when they don't have access to these resources that are being created and that have historically been created to facilitate their assimilation into mainstream institutions, we, we, we lose out on investing in more meaningful ways on the youth that are here in our homelands. Um, for our community-led watershed project, that took the form of having to challenge and rewrite um, uh, federal grant policies that required a high school diploma or a GED in order to hire uh, our young people in our community. We exercised our right to change those requirements so that we could invest and bring in and train and give these skills to the youth that have continually fallen be 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 um, in into these gaps. And in and, and doing that, um, also actively creating these pathways to leadership that invest in building their insights and their sense of purpose as defenders and stewards of our lands. And, you know, we, we see this in so much, this, 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 this type of model being replicated in so many different areas of cultural revitalization, language revitalization. And we, he, we see um, our own young people who have gone through universities and colleges returning back to their homelands to unlearn and uncondition some of the most harmful lessons that are taught in those institutions in order to reconnect with the land. Uh, I think there's this misconception that our youth don't care or that our youth aren't aware of and, and don't notice or, or aren't bothered by the impacts of climate change. Um, but in our experience, it's the exact opposite. It's just that our youth haven't been given the resources they need to explore and build um, and build this sense of purpose uh, to address these impacts, to help their families, to help their communities. And there we can plant these seeds of, 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 um, of survival, of survivance and resilience, and make sure that they serve as those main bridges um, uh, to transfer knowledge from our elder generations to our future generations. And I think that now more than ever, it's important to find those pathways, um, to create those pathways of investment in our young people. Thank you, Janine. Um, 
I've received a lot of questions now. I'm going to read out three questions and in the interests of time, I'm going to allocate one question to each speaker. Um, if other panelists would like to comment on other questions, that's fine, but please, um, if, we could, if you could try to keep your um, answers concise just so that we can get through as many audience questions as possible. The first one seems incredibly relevant to me, which is very simple but very probing. Is there a practical solution to resolving the conflict between big business and Indigenous communities? Um, Dr. Senna has mentioned the doctrine of discovery and Janine uses the language of colonialism, um, exploitation, capitalistic models. Janine, perhaps if, we, if I can ask you to offer a response to this huge but vitally important question. The second question uh, comes from Annie Signorelli who asks, how can companies developing renewable energy projects ensure that their critical position in the transition to a low carbon economy does not come at the cost of Indigenous peoples who are often the last to directly benefit from these new energies? And are there best practices for engaging with Indigenous peoples on sustainable benefit sharing practices? Um, Dr. Senna, if you would uh, take the honours in responding to that question, that would be much appreciated. And then finally, for Antonella, we have a question from Thakur Shohan from uh, CARE Nepal, who's, who asks, as food security, livelihoods and climate change, uh, who is the food, food security, livelihoods and climate change program coordinator? Uh, Takur asks, while talking about Indigenous communities for building their resilience to climate change, William, women from these communities are further differentially impacted from climate change and disaster. In your experiences, what would be the appropriate, uh, practice, the, the appropriate practices to address their particular needs? So Janine, if, if we could start with you, please. Thank you very much. I wish I had the solution for this <laughs> um, but we have been part of uh, many growing efforts to address this conflict between corporations and indigenous peoples and a lot of um, what we've already shared about respecting the land the rights to lands territories and resources of indigenous peoples implementing the, the un declaration of rights of indigenous peoples and holding corporations and governments accountable to these rights um, are all key aspects of that um, but there are um, growing efforts such as um, what we're leading through the Global Landscape Forum to develop a gold standard and rights-based approaches to landscape management, but also through the Indigenous Peoples Major Group's um, Right Energy Partnership uh, that are creating pathways for understanding <clears throat> how to use rights-based approaches to development, meaning using a human rights framework when assessing and developing um, any type of development process projects. In these, one of the core elements is that Indigenous peoples are on equal footing with corporations and governments as decision makers, not to further enable or justify the continued exploitation of resources, but to better bring better, more holistic, more sustainable and localized solutions to those decision making processes. And a large part of this relies on, on corporations understanding that economic wealth cannot be the sole uh, um, pursuit in, in development decisions. We have to understand and bring value to social cultural impacts and to social cultural investments in all communities, not just indigenous peoples. We should no longer be dependent on economy and uh, on an economy and on economic practices that further embed and build off of the inequality that have been rooted and woven into these systems from their conception. We can and must do better. Our, our future depends on it and the well-being of all of our communities depend on it. You know, it's, it's really difficult being an indigenous person in, in global space, from North America in global spaces because a lot of times we're perceived as being privileged since we have the status of being in a so-called first world country. Um, but the reality is that here in the United States, we have one of the largest income wealth, wealth gaps and in, 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 in inequalities uh, in the world. 
And we, we, and it's because, you know, like I, I, we often say we're in the belly of the beast. We're in the belly of empire where so much of the ideologies of corporations and corporate capitalism is embedded and was built upon the theft and the, the genocide of our peoples. And until we can resolve that historic, that historic truth and, and, and collectively, um, fix uh, uh, the pathways to decision making and leadership in these decisions, uh, we're going to continue to replicate these problems. So the only way to resolve this conflict between corporations is ind and indigenous peoples is by taking those few first steps, by holding corporations and governments accountable to the rights of indigenous peoples and taking a rights-based approach to development. Thank you, Janine. Uh, can I turn to Dr. Senna next for the question about renewable en energy projects and their critical position to the tr in the transition to a low carbon economy? And Dr. Senna, your microphone is still on mute if you're able to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. So thank you so much, Janine, for uh, some for your comments, and I think they are very, very helpful uh, in answering my question. And I really like the words that you've used that indigenous peoples are on the belly of the beast. Uh, and, and of course, the beast can never be satisfied because there's too much greed in this world. People just want to get wealthy, 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 wealthy without limit. Uh, but also, the fact that we are in the belly of the beast has actually uh, limited us a bit to only focusing on rights rather than thinking uh, on uh, interests. What, what are indigenous people's interests beyond just human rights? As Antonella said, we cannot eat right. So we must also uh, look for a way for indigenous peoples to, uh, to, to safeguard their interests, to safeguard their futures using some of these processes that are actually being undertaken. One example that I want to give is, uh, as you've said, the rights and energy projects. Uh, as much as uh, for uh, the rights and energy with Indigenous Peoples Partnership was launched, when I look at the discussion of that partnership in the context of Africa, it has so focused so much on the negative things that uh, renewable energy projects are doing on Indigenous Peoples' lands. However, my perspective is that the same idea of uh, renewable energy can be used as a factor of safeguarding indigenous people's lands if indigenous people's lands are supported to invest in those kind of projects. As I said initially, biogas, they, they have big lands, they can do solar, they, have, they can do small dams for their own, if that is what they wish. It all depends on their self-determination, self but it can be used as an instrument to safeguard their rights. So what is key here between uh, the interface between investors and renewable energy experts and renewable energy investors is the investment model that is being suggested. When we look at most of Africa, uh, the investment model is uh, the government decides that a geothermal plant must come up here or a, a solar farm or a wind farm must be raised here. So the next thing is evict the people who stay there. However, that should not be the case. And one of the examples that I want to give you, and that's something that I would request the listeners to look for, is that we did a study on best practices on uh, renewable energy projects, and we looked at what was happening in one project, one wind farm project in Kenya called Kipeto Energy Project. What happened in this project is that the investors did not, in, did not evict the people, no. They leased their land, then they started paying some lease fee, over the period of uh, feasibility study. And then as soon as the project goes up, the, the lease fee increases. So in this way, the, the project managed to generate good community goodwill. In fact, they even gave the company, they even gave the community 5% equity in the company. So this, uh, this actually generated a lot of goodwill from the community rather than that, that, that the models were the communities are evicted and uh, their livelihood destroyed and etc. So this model, uh, the, the investment model here ensured that the community continued to hold their land, but at the same time benefiting something small from the wind from project, but most importantly, continuing with their livelihood system. It's all a matter of self-determination. 
And that one of the things that I've always been pushing for, for example, in the African continent, in the case of renewable of energy, indigenous communities have so much. They have a lot of wildlife, at least uh, livestock. At least every home has about 5, 10, 15, 20 livestock. That's a lot of cow dung that can be used to generate biogas, to use for energy, to use for for for, for cooking, uh, cooking, electricity, and uh, uh, many other things. Unfortunately, many of the biogas projects we see are just very small scale, but we haven't had an intensive indigenous people's-led project where all this uh, waste, waste, animal waste can be collected and generate energy that can have a biomass project that can have an impact on the grid and uh, ensuring also that indigenous people get their own energy supplies. Because of course, as I said, we must look at the issue from an interest not not precisely just a right base, but also an interest base. Indigenous people also need energy. So I think what is important here then is to understand uh, the investment model that is being put in place. When the investment model aims at evicting and just profits for the investor, then that becomes a challenge. But if the investment model is, let's all benefit, win-win, let's all win-win, I think indigenous people would be more uh, acceptable. And it's very simple. In, in, investors come to an indigenous territory, they identify a, a renewable resource, they don't have the money, so they go to a bank and borrow the money. So what can stop indigenous people from doing the same? Getting organized. And that's why I like the, the, the program in America where, in America and Canada, wherever, where indigenous people are leading their own energy projects. I really like that, and I think this is an idea that should be replicated in the African continent. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Senna. And we have just a few minutes uh, for Antonella to ask to answer the final question about uh, women's specific needs relating to the impacts of climate change and best practices for how to address these. And Antonella, your your microphone is currently muted. If you're able to unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, thank you. And uh, just to add one uh, um, uh, small experience to what Kaninke was saying, um, uh, I think uh, uh, recently uh, a small project has been approved as part of the adaptation fund for indigenous people's communities on renewable energy. <coughs> And um, uh, what is important is that the resources the, are in the hands of the community themselves. And they decide what kind of renewable energy um, is you know, best fitted for their uh, communities and villages and who they shall contract. Of course, you also need to support, um, uh, to support the communities in uh, selecting um, uh, you know, the firms that are going to install, for, in, for instance, the solar panel. But what is important is that, once again, um, resources have, have to be in the hands of uh, the communities themselves for them to decide uh, how to go about it. And the same uh, to answer the question on uh, the differentiated impacts of climate change between men and women. It's interesting because we started studying this um, back in 2009 um, when with uh, the then UNIFEM, and um, we uh, had a study of Adivasi women engaging with climate change exactly to assess which are the differentiated impact between men and women, and particularly indigenous, or in this case, Adivasi women in India, um, uh, when it comes to climate change. And uh, this is an area that I'm not sure um, it is uh, well researched, and what the impacts are in order to provide the responses adequately. But going back, for instance, to what we have been discussing so far about governance, I think um, the um, evolving situation um, uh, has to evolve also within indigenous people's communities. Uh, so if resources are shrinking and if decisions have to be making on management of resources, do indigenous women have 
uh, a voice in decision making? Can they decide on uh, what are the crops uh, that need uh, to be uh, grown in, in a certain period and in, in what lands? Uh, so to me, uh, what is important is really, first of all, to understand what the dynamics are, um, what are the um, uh, the, the differentiated impacts, how to improve decision making of indigenous women within their communities and within the organizations also that work with indigenous peoples, and uh, importantly, uh, capacity building for alternative livelihoods uh, to, um, to um, adapt and mitigate uh, climate change, meaning that um, resources should be made available, for instance, uh, to indigenous women, uh, also when it comes to renewable energy, for instance, which often uh, becomes, you know, controlled by men at community level. Uh, so I, I, I thank you for, uh, for this question, because I think it's something uh, we need to um, uh, research better, and I take this opportunity to flag few publications uh, uh, that if had um, uh, developed. One is on the traditional knowledge advantage, indigenous people's knowledge in climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies coming out from our projects. The other one is the indigenous people's collective rights to land territories and resources, where we also include lessons from uh, IFAD supported projects. And finally, since we've talked a lot about free prior and informed consent, um, we have developed a guideline for IFAD, but which is useful for communities when development projects are brought in their communities on how to seek free prior and informed consent in IFAD funded projects. Thank you very much Antonella and that concludes today's webinar. Uh, there will be a recording posted on the LAND portal. Uh, it will also be posted to the LAND portal's YouTube page and shared via email to those who RSVP'd but were not able to join. Uh, I would like to once more thank Stacey and Neil from, from the LAND portal for their organisational support for this webinar and to our panellists Dr Kanyinki Sina, Janine Yazzi and Antella, Antonella Cordone. Thank you so much for such deep and uh, rousing insights today and we look forward to continuing the conversation in the future. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.